Um, although it was at short notice, it was very helpful because um, what we're going to do today, I'm going to do today, uh, is actually pull together some thoughts that we've been working on for a while in the gallery. Um, and um, <clears throat> so we're beginning, the, the idea is, um, in 1966, um, Amos Vogel, who's a theatre critic, theatre critic, film critic, um, and theoretician, uh, published a, an essay that included 13 confusions, um, and these were the 13 confusions that he felt dogged the um, avant-garde film world at the time, and he described what he was trying to do was um, a critique from within. This was a friend of uh, that that sector looking at it from within and saying, what are the things that we really need to, the confusions that we need, really need to clear up? And then in January 2011, Dan Fox um, updated this, um, this list for what he was talking about was the retooled um, Vogel's list, expanding its remit from the underground film of the 1960s to what could be called the above ground art world of 2010. Um, and as uh, Fox notes, some of these uh, Vogel's confusions are now long finished turf battles um, or obsolete theoretical issues. Um, although the, the issues raised by Vogel reflect a number of enduring concerns that should inform any rigorous critical analysis. Uh, for example, I think few of us would quibble with the importance of not confusing one swallow with a summer or Fox's related confusing a moment with a movement. And there are specific challenges uh, related to the new and the avant-garde, uh, which are contained within both Fox and Vogel's lists. So what we're go I'm gonna do this morning is, um, it's not a critical reflection on Vogel and Fox, but rather I'm gonna use their, their text as a starting point to propose 13 rather unruly and incohate um, confusions with the aim of stimulating debate, which I guess moves us on to probably a 14th confusion, which is don't confuse a polemic um, with a critique. So on that note, um, <coughs> and the technology is a bit unruly, or rather, I'm a bit unruly with the technology, um, as you've just witnessed. So these are, the, these are the ones from 1966 for Vogel. I'm not going to go through them, um, but the notes, if anybody wants them, um, are available. And then Fox updated these in 2011. And those are available at this, um, uh, up the Freeze article, which is a short five minute read, but certainly worth uh, looking at to stimulate. And these are the 13 confusions uh, that I'm going to run through today with the, uh, the quote from Foucault, which I think is, is um, a caution about the way uh, we, we're considering this, that the only valid tribute to thought such as Nietzsche's is precisely to use it, to deform it, to make it groan and protest. And if commentators then say that I'm being unfaithful to Nietzsche, that is of absolutely no interest. So the first confusion is cost and price, and this was, which is a, from Fox. And actually, cost and price really breaks down into two elements. The first one is you don't confuse production costs with the retail price. What it costs you to make a work of art is of no consequence to what you can sell it for in a financial way. You might make something and you might sweat blood over it, and like <coughs> Hearst's diamonds. That cost a fortune to make, but in my view, it's worth nothing, because that comes on to the second point, which is don't confuse the retail price, the price that the market will pay for something, with its cultural value. The two over the long run, hopefully, become aligned. But in the short term, you have things like Hearst piece, which has no cultural value whatsoever, in my opinion, potentially selling for a lot of money. So that's the first confusion, I think, that is really important. And that sort of links to uh, uh, the rise over the last 20, 30 years of art that's considered as a luxury good. So why is it that in London, lots of the high-end art galleries <coughs> are actually located next to Hermes in Bond Street. And that's also linked somewhat, 
I mean, I would say there that obviously arts always had a role as a signifier in the sense of Bart signifier and signified. So we shouldn't ignore that, but it's as a luxury good um, in quite the way it is at the moment. And then secondly, the rise of art as a financial asset class. Um, <coughs> I think um, on that note, one of the things that if you're going to understand the art market, that it's an oligopoly, and it's an oligopoly that is controlled by um, a combination of the commercial world as well as the not-for-profit world. So I'm moving on. That's the first confusion. I'm going to whip through these because I've not got much time. <laughs> Vogel talks about don't um, confuse propagandists with critics. And, and that's really about the importance of transparency and identifying people's mo motivations. For example, I think it's really important that we don't confuse speculators with collectors. So within, in the art world, you get certain people who have very high profile, but all they want to do is to buy young artists in the hope that their prices go up. And they don't really care about the young artists. So they will go and they will buy whole bodies of work from 20 or 30 young artists that are relatively cheap. And all they want to do is hope that one of those goes up a lot and the rest they'll discard. Those are speculators, those are not collectors. Collectors have a fundamental role in um, <coughs> providing funds to the art market, but also in, collect in preserving and conserving works of art. So collectors, I think, have an important role within the ecosystem, and they're very different from speculators, and please don't get the two confused. And also, don't confuse a friend with a critic. Um, there's a, a very, I think, important um, pioneer of what one might term to be net art, new media art. And she came up to me, and I've developed a good relationship with her. And she said, oh, you know, and there's something wrong. This is one of the exhibitions we'd done in the gallery. And, she was, and I could tell she was agitated about something. And we chatted, and she, she didn't open up about it. And then about four or five weeks later, when I was actually walking on a beach with her, she opened up what the problem was, and it was that, and I agreed with her, we'd done this exhibition, some of the work in the exhibition wasn't very good. And she felt uncomfortable telling me that she felt that, and I agreed with her. But as a gallerist, we have a responsibility to support our artists, and that's supporting them with the ability, the right to fail. That's really important, that if you're going to experiment and you're going to push boundaries, you're not always going to be successful. You have to fail. That's part of being at the cutting edge. So that's not a problem for us, and we support our artists through that. And we'll tell them when we think their work's shit. Um, but this artist <laughs> was felt unable to tell her friend, because it was her friend, that she didn't think this work was very good. And I think it's really important that we don't, we don't confuse friendship. We don't confuse being inside a small group with having critical distance. And if we are really going to make the art that we all believe in, which we are choosing to talk of as media art, appreciated culturally, taking us back to the first confusion, then I think it's really important that we develop this critical distance. And so I think that's partly about propagandists with critics. And I'm just throwing up some quotes there which people can... Um, uh, consider um, at a later date. The next and a related one that both Vogel and Fox talked about is literary critics. Don't confuse literary critics with visual critics. And this is about the importance of identifying roles and expertise. And I will read this quote at the bottom here because I think it's important. Um, one of the great breakthroughs in digital art is the great practice of Ian Chain that all of a sudden Video is no longer has to be a loop, but now can be an algorithm, a complex dynamic system that can evolve and change. If you have a video of Ian Chains in a room over the next 50 or 100 years, this video is going to evolve in unpredictable ways. We will never have the same film. That was said by a prominent critic, curator of world renown, who works in one of the world's major galleries two weeks ago. Now, I bet everybody in this room can point out multiple works from before Ian Cheng that do exactly that. And that's the danger of we need to, 
you know, that this guy does not have the expertise. Clearly, it's not constructive to take him head on. What we have to do, one of our roles, is to gently point out through doing exhibitions, through writing, etc., cetera, um, and having conversations with the aforementioned curator. Um, and the other one I just wanted to point out here um, about don't confuse gallerists with speculators or collectors or curators. And that's just a plea that people understand the role of the gallerist in the ecosystem. And the role of the gallerist, um, we're the only people who are focused on selling an artist's work. Nobody else is interested. Our job is to, our primary job is to sell the artist's work. So the artist can put bread on the table and make more work. The second point about that is, our responsibility to the artist is to look after their long-term career development. So we are constantly thinking and talking to them about what residences they should do, what exhibitions they should be in, etc. And it's a long-term relationship. When you represent somebody, it's like getting married to them. So don't confuse, the role of the gallerist is essential to a lot of artists because you have that long-term relationship. And when you think about it, how many of the people within the art world have a long-term relationship with the artist? Curators don't, collectors don't necessarily, certainly public collectors don't, private collectors often do. So that's, I think, it's important we, uh, that we bear in mind the importance of identifying roles and expertise uh, within, the work, within the art world. Don't confuse publicity with achievement, which both Vogel and Fox came up with and I think is still very important. And I think that's just the importance of critical distance and detailed research, witness the previous point. Um, <clears throat> but don't also confuse a lack of publicity with a lack of achievement. As I think, you know, people working within anything that's avant-garde or, or new, um, often the, the fact that nobody, you don't have the major publicity doesn't mean to say you're not doing great work. Um, <clears throat> and don't cons and the, that relates to don't confuse novelty with originality. I mean, you, uh, there's lots of work, and it looks fantastic, but it's, it's one swallow with a summer, which is another of Vogel's, or it's the typist with the writer. What we're interested in is the writer, the people who really have the original thoughts, not the people who copy others. So that's don't confuse publicity with achievement. I think this, play, this plays to something that you said earlier. Fox talks about don't confuse the art world and the wor with the world. And I think that's about the importance of a sense of perspective. Contemporary art is a small world uh, that lies outside the direct experience of most people. When you think about contemporary art relative to television or cinema or theater, the printed word and screen-based work, Contemporary art's a very small world. And it's interesting when you talk about, when we look at the echo and the open work, if I remember right, I think echo used the example of a football match as, as an open work, not a work of art. He used a very, very resonant contemporary, uh, sorry, common um, cultural example. Um, and I think the other point there, <laughs> there is, um, that doesn't mean to say that contemporary art can't, isn't an integral part of people's lives and can't make a difference. It can, and it does. But I think we just need to have a sense of perspective um, and also a mission to make it a bigger part of, of, of people's lives. Now we get onto some that are actually Carol Fletcher ones. Uh, don't confuse media art with art. As far as we can say, media art is art, and it is contemporary art. Media art may not be mainstream contemporary art, but mainstream contemporary art is not the whole of contemporary art. As was said earlier, there is a huge um, iceberg there, <laughs> and the mainstream contemporary art is that little bit that has all this prominence, and underneath it, there is so much more really rich, beautiful, important work. But that doesn't mean to say there aren't very specific um, uh, curatorial and conservation considerations with respect to media art. There are. 
and it's, it is that there are specialisms within that. But I think it's really important, and I, and I just put a range of different quotes up there to say that, because this is a continuing problem of, but, um, from within, whether it's Inca and Yaakov. But I will just read um, the Manfred Moore's quote, partly because we represent Manfred. Um, it shouldn't be called computer art in the first place. There's confusion between how something is produced and what you show. Nobody says he's a pencil artist because he only makes drawings. I always laugh when people ask if it was art. What else is it? It's what I do. It's either art that it's interesting or it's nothing. And that's the way we think in the gallery is we don't care what you call it. What we care is, is it interesting? Does it make people think? Does it make people feel? And then we can, you can call it a glass for all I care. Well, that's actually Mark, Michael Craig Martin, isn't it? An, an oak tree. But that's our touchstone. But it's not a new issue. I mean, it goes back to the, the quote there from Alan Capwell. Um, and I think it's really important that we, we try to remove some of these distinctions and just focus on what we think is really great about it from a pure art perspective, the content. Um, don't confuse the real and the physical. What we mean by that is the physical and the virtual are both aspects of reality. It's not in real life versus on the computer. It's all very, very real to people. And they're two separate but related worlds, which is why we're very, we, we, we have a physical gallery space in East Castle Street in London, you know, 400 square meters of exhibition space, and we have an online space that we exhibit in. The next confusion from our point of view is a slightly more complicated one, and this is one that we're working through. Don't confuse form with content. And this is about that the online, browse, the online space and browser-based works are of equal validity important, and importance as physical gallery and, mat and material works. And that's about ex just exploring when you see people and they take a work and they take it from this online space, they take a website and they put it in the gallery space. What are the motivations behind that move? If it's a native work to the internet, why take it off the internet? Why take it out of the browser? And often when you, th when, when you look at it, the motivations behind that, mo that shift are based on finance and prestige. They're based on the belief that you can only sell work that's physical, that's material. That's where the market is. So the shift there is financial. Or it's because it's prestige. It's because, well, if I show it in a white cube gallery space, all the critics will write about it and people will come along. So neither of those, neither of those motivations for, 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 for displaying the work in the gallery space are artistic. And in our view, only if there's an artistic reason should you make that shift. Our role as, a, as the gallerist <clears throat> is to try and make, is, is, to, is to work hard to make it that you, um, you can sell online work because in the end, the URL is unique. There is an aura to the browser. It's not actually infinitely reproducible in quite the way that, that, that people think it is. Um, and it's our job then to um, do interesting exhibitions online, to think about what does it mean to do an exhibition online? What is that environment? What is that space? What's the materiality of that space? And if you look at the way that artists work, um, who are doing cutting edge stuff in that area, they're really thinking hard about the structure of that space, the materiality of the internet, or the browser, rather. Um, and I think that, why we're saying form and content is because if you do bring something into the gallery space, it should be because you have a concept, you have an idea, you ha have something you want to communicate or explore. And you, 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 you then take that concept and you think about reimagining it within that physical space. And then you start to have a work in the physical space that has authenticity and integrity. So overpinning it is an idea that we're sort of working on at the moment called, of the meta work, which is, which is that underpinning most of the artworks is there's an idea. 
and that idea has an instantiation in different environments and different contexts. Um, and that goes back to, I mean, the, you know, the idea becomes a machine that makes the art from Sol Lewitt. So we're not saying anything particularly new. Um, <clears throat> and I think the Jesse Darling quotes, you know, from somebody who's a young artist working today um, is, is worth bearing in mind, <laughs> even if it does sort of reprise a little bit of what Crossett says about quotes. Uh, to take this work out of the browser and into the gallery is not an act of recuperation, but an act of deterritorialization, a violent reification that forces a commodity value upon a product with a use value confined to a particular context. And I think it's worth bearing in mind um, Jesse's words. Um, the next caution, it's confusing. Uh, don't confuse a lack with an insoluble problem. A lack of information or experience or language or theory is not, does, doesn't necessarily mean it's an insoluble problem. You know, consider the, the perils of the early adopter, which people have talked about. It's like my <clears throat> business partner, the Carolus of Carol Fletcher, owns Raphael Azanahama's 33 questions a minute. I think he was the first person to be electrocuted by it. It didn't put him off, he just went back to Raphael and talked about the work and they solved the problem. He also owns Raphael's um, pulse room, which is made up of incandescent light bulbs. Well, that's a slight problem when incandescent light bulbs are going to be outlawed. But it's only a slight problem. You think about what's the essence of the work, how do you solve it? Well, part of the solution was to go and buy a hell of a lot of incandescent light bulbs. But obviously, that's only a short-term solution. Um, and it's also about the shock of the new. It's not just those, you know, we've had this for, for, for generations or centuries upon centu centuries. And that's about what we need to do is to develop a new language and tropes and technical expertise and critical theory, et cetera, to enable us to talk about this work, to figure out what it takes. And I think the quote from Domenico um, Quaranta is, 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 is a good rallying call for us. Um, which I will read, uh, just because I think um, it's in the spirit of, with regards to the world of new media art, Holy Fire, which is an exhibition that Domenico um, curated, uh, wants to challenge some diehard preconceptions, like it's dismiss dismissive, that is, um, the world, attitude towards the role played by the market uh, and its reiterated assumptions that new media art is immaterial, disseminated, collaborative, and open, difficult to preserve and therefore not preservable, difficult to lect that, collect therefore not collectible, difficult to sell and therefore not saleable, difficult to preserve. What about Leonardo's Last Supper? Difficult to collect. Cristo, immaterial. Air de Paris by Duchamp, collaborative, the Fluxus Boxes, all things that have found their own solid position in art history. So um, that's also a plea which sort of comes into the, the next one, which is a, a more another, I think, point that's worth unpicking, which is don't confuse copy with the original. Um, and that's sort of about the, the importance of standardized contracts within the art world. There's a lot of talk about sharing and collaboration and editioning and versioning and translating um, and, and how they sort of fundamentally undermine. And they do in a way, and there are some really important problems that need to be solved. But at the same time, they don't result in the death of the author. And I hate saying that, saying Bart after it, because it's actually another confusion or a caution that I, which is don't, um, don't confuse a reference with learning, um, or otherwise the emperor's new clothes syndrome, uh, which is that you see in so many texts, people just throwing away saying, as Bart says, or as Foucault says, and it means nothing because there's no substance behind it, so I apologize. I would have put, some, I would have put something more, of more substance in. Um, but what I do think that this symbols is more like um, the birth of the collector as a patron and as a curator, which I think was sort of alluded to earlier. Um, that um, the collector has a, has a role within the contract uh, that we that we're working that we work with, 
you know, the collector not only has rights, the rights to exhibit a work or to loan a work, whatever, but they also have responsibilities. So, for example, in the standardized internet contract that Raphael Rosendahl started off and Evan Roth and other people and Constant Dullar have updated, um, in the event that the collector doesn't fulfill their responsibilities, the work of art reverts to the artist. So a collector does have responsibilities and increasingly those are contained within um, uh, the contract. And um, I've just put, there's a lot of quotes there which sort of emphasize the um, uh, complexity um, of the issue, but I think the, the point there is that there are certain issues, there are to do with copying, et cetera, that we need to rethink about the structure of the market when it comes to um, uh, digital art. But I don't think, I think that you will always have people called patrons who care about art and are supporting um, the artist and are buying work uh, that symbolizes their patronage, their, 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 their support of, of the artist. Um, and this leads on to don't confuse a painting with a performance. And that's the problem caused by selling the performance as a painting. Um, and what, what we're talking about there is it's also the importance now of having an open dialogue uh, between the artist and the audience that interrogates the work and results in a common understanding of the work. Because I think what happened in the rush to sell things, that things were sold as one thing when actually they were another. And that was partly because whether it was, was us as gallerists just, or, 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 the, or the artists just being keen to get some money in. Um, and an example of, of uh, where it's important for this, what do we mean by it being a performance? Well, if you take, there's a work by Thompson and Craighead called um, <clears throat> Horizon. Um, and Horizon is um, basically, it's based on live internet feeds. And the challenge there obviously is um, of webcams. Those internet feeds will go down over time. And actually part of the work is that what you have now, which looks like this array of uh, live web, web, web feeds, over time will, will, will just be a blank screen. So it, and we've dealt with that issue in two ways. One is to emphasize that it's a performative work. It's a work that is commenting upon that's, that's immersed in the nature of technology and the nature of the, of the internet and the World Wide Web. And that is that it has this obsolescence built into it. So this work is performing over who knows how long, but, and eventually it will die. But at the same time, what, what, but if the collector understands that, he, can, he she could price that into their decision about whether they want to buy the work. But if you don't tell them that, and in two years' time, the work becomes a black screen, of course the collector's pissed off. And that's happened in so many different examples over the last 20 years. But if, you know, the, but if there is a dialogue so that people realize what they're getting, they can make a decision. And so there's a lot of artists that <clears throat> now who are spending a lot of time maintaining old work because they know they have to. Um, and so a, a good example, if you want to look at somebody who's got the best practice, of good practice, is Raphael Lozana Hemmer, who publishes all his code pub and, and online. So you can go look at R Raphael's website, and you can see the detailed instruction manuals about the work, as well as the code, so that you're, you're able to uh, um, understand what you're getting and, and hopefully preserve it. But that's about the responsibilities of the collector. So for example, with Horizon, Thompson and Craighead will review the links once every six months, but only for the next five years, because obviously they can't do it forever. And they'll give you the instructions to enable them for you to do it yourself, because it's actually relatively straightforward. And then the collector takes on that responsibility, but that's all contained within a standardized um, contract. But the nature of that work, and this is where it's, I think, theoretically it's important that, you know, if you look at a work by, say, Jody, like 9w's.jody.org, Whilst they'll talk about that as performative, in the sense that the, 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 there's the code and the software is then performing the code and the hardware is reading, the, et cetera, et cetera. 
so that you get that exploded bomb. I don't know if you know the work. Um, and it was, which was, began as a mistake, leaving out a bracket in the HTML code. Um, but that work is finished. It doesn't, it doesn't really evolve through time. There might be issues to do with the browser it's on or whatever else, but it's effectively more like a painting, as is like a Manfred Moore. Not just Manfred's um, drawings or paintings, but his, his moving image work, which evolves through time and never repeats itself 20 years before Ian Cheng, um, but it's, it's a closed system. Whereas works like a John Cage 43 minutes, 33 seconds is an evolving work. It's never the same. And, and it's evolving in really unlikely ways. And Thompson Craigheads is, and that is, is a horizon is performative. And if you talk to Evan Roth about his landscape series, they're performances. So I think we, there's a, um, a theoretical change here in, in the way some works are thought about, but the important thing in terms of the confusion is you don't get static works mixed up with performative work. And you need to be very clear with, the, with, with, with people what it is they're involved with. So with the Thompson Craighead work, the other way we solved the problem was um, we did a 24 hour effectively, because it's a film, it, it, it's, it works on a 24 hour cycle. So we did a 24 hour, we, we took a 24 hour screen grab almost. So we made a 24 hour film. So when the collector purchases the work, they have these other things apart from their ownership of um, the software, et cetera. Um, and so again, that's about that open dialogue with the collector, about understanding the nature of the work. And, and, and for the collector, Sometimes it is, it's, 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 it's not just a false scarcity that you're creating or a scarcity that you're creating. You're creating some interesting objects which give the collector a, uh, a, 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 a record of what they're involved in. And actually they're coming from this position of patronage. So actually, yeah, they want to know that the work is gonna go up and there's maybe a secondary market for the work, but. They're not, necessary, they're not thinking of it as a financial asset that they're going to speculate on. Um, and then very quickly, uh, don't confuse art and entertainment, and that's really about the persistence of uh, elitist invalid hierarchies and divisions such as entertainment and art, highbrow and lowbrow, et cetera. Um, and that isn't to say that you know, art isn't different, that there isn't something about art, but art can be entertainment, and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, as David Foster Wallace observes, um, entertainers can divert and console, only artists can transfigure. And finally, um, this is a Vogel quote or confusion, don't confuse good with bad. And I think judgment with an open, discursive, democratic, constructive, critical framework matters. It matters that we have a critical framework and we are willing to stand up and say, that's good and that's bad. But that doesn't mean to say, for me, the Sunday painter is as valid on certain metrics and important as Picasso. But that's because you're dealing with the Sunday painter on the right framework, because that, that for that person is really important and, it, and that process of going out and, take, and, and, and drawing or painting or whatever r enriches their life. But they're not saying that, that that work as a work, as an object, if you like, has any intrinsic cultural value. They're saying the process has value to them as an individual. And that's different. As soon as you put it out there in the public domain for people to come and look at, you have to be willing to deal with criticism and judgment. But as long as it's constructive criticism and it's open and it's informed criticism, that's fine. And I think that's really important that we, that, that we have to say that some of the work, one of the reasons, I mean, we were all talking, there was a, a, a Krista um, mentioned about um, the Oliver Grau, I think it was, and stuff disappearing. Well, that's always happened. The work we remember now is the tip of the iceberg of what's been produced in the past because not everything that was produced was good. And not everything produced has lasting cu cultural value. But the things that do, as was pointing out, like whether it be Shakespeare or Goethe, 
has that ability, as Foster Wallace said, to transfigure. And I think that's what we're all hopefully doing. Hopefully some people can do it that transfigures the room and some other people just transfigure themselves. And either one is valid. And on that note, um, that's it. Those are our 13 confusions um, for discussion.